Thank you. So uh, good afternoon, and uh, this is the uh, first joint ISMIX uh, ESDS uh, uh, session uh, that we have here. We just had one at the ISMIX meeting. Uh, unfortunately, my partner, uh, Dr. Mahajan, couldn't be here to talk about bronchoscopic uh, ablation because of a family emergency. So I'm going to give an update on thermal ablation for lung cancer and, and focus on percutaneous and bronchoscopic approaches. Um, I'll cover radio frequency ablation, microwave ablation, and then we'll finish with talking about bronchoscopic ablation. So looking first of all at percutaneous uh, RFA, uh, or actually percutaneous ablation, this was a series that we published at, uh, from Boston University. And we had 21 patients who had tumors uh, three centimeters or less in size. Uh, you can see that their uh, pulmonary function was quite impaired, uh, FEV1 of 39% and a DLCO of 47%. And the Charleston comorbidity index was high for these patients at 5.5. Seven patients were on home oxygen and five patients had large bully on CT scan. These patients had a total of 25 ablations and uh, we did mediastinoscopy whenever we saw suspicious lymph nodes. At a mean follow-up of 42 months, overall survival was at two years was 81% and at three years was 52%. And the median survival was 39 months. We did see local recurrences uh, and, the, and the median time to progression was 35 months. And these patients were treated with either SBRT or with additional ablation. So this was our center's experience. And then this was a, a multi-center study run through the American College of Surgeons Oncology Group. The study was called Z4033. Uh, it was a prospective phase two study looking at the technique of percutaneous ablation. Uh, in this study, we had 51 patients, all with histological confirmed non-small cell lung cancer, a median size of two, uh, two centimeters, but allowed up to three centimeters. And you'll see again that the lung function was impaired, FEV1 of 48, DLC of 43.7. And every patient who entered this trial had to be evaluated by a study surgeon who, who said that this patient was not a candidate either for a wedge or for a lobectomy. Um, so these were truly impaired patients. And, and you'll see over here when you look at adverse events that uh, our grade three to grade five adverse events, which is on the uh, left-hand column on the screen, uh, was only 11.8%. Now on the right hand side of the screen, uh, there's a similar study that was done on SBRT, which was also a, a, a multi-center study. Uh, and, and you'll see that the complication rate for grade three or higher was actually a little higher at 23.6%. And I put this up really to say, you'll hear the radiation oncologists talking about how the risks of uh, RFA or uh, microwave ablation are much higher. Uh, when in fact, a grade three or higher uh, complications are probably a little bit less with uh, ablation. Overall survival in this multi-center trial was about 70% at two years. Uh, and in terms of local occurrences, there were again a fairly uh, reasonable number of local recurrences, but these were treated again with either repeat ablation or radiation. So this is RFA uh, and uh, factors that imp impacted survival with smaller tumors uh, did better at two centimeters uh, or less. Uh, and then if we look at uh, other series that are out there um, and you'll see in uh, uh, a number of different papers, number of uh, different sites, two year survival is around 70% um, and very few papers that are reported on five year survival. Uh, but not a huge, uh, not huge series, but a, a few papers that are out there. Now the industry standard is rapidly becoming microwave and RFA is going out, out of the window a little bit. And uh, the reasons for this are not completely clear. And there's not uh, a lot of uh, studies that have been done, particularly in lung, comparing microwave and RF. Um, and so you'll see over here a, a study with 141 patients. It was a randomized study comparing microwave and, and RF. And the authors found no difference in survival, but they did find that microwave was superior for bigger tumors, that you had better ablations for the bigger tumors. So perhaps they're a benefit. And then here, the only other randomized study that I could find, uh, 52 patients with stage four disease, and they did follow up at six and 12 months, and they found no difference in survival between the two uh, modalities, except that uh, when they looked at pain, pain was less with microwave. And, for the, and, and there was more significant reduction in tumor size. So perhaps again, for bigger tumors, microwave uh, wins out. So 
uh, taking that data in hand and kind of now going on to bronchoscopic ablation, because this is really the next frontier. And this is the next step in evolution of therapies for lung cancer. Potentially, it's going to allow the surgeon or the pulmonologist to make a diagnosis and treatment in the same setting. Uh, there's probably going to be a lower risk of pneumothorax compared to percutaneous approaches, just like with biopsy. But we need to have improvements in navigation technology, and we also have to have uh, available uh, flexible ab uh, ablation systems that are all approved and uh, safe to use. So let's look at the accuracy question first with navigation bronchoscopy. And you can see here a number of uh, different papers that have looked at the success rates of navigation bronchoscopy. And none of them are at 100%. And if we are going to now start navigating and then ablating, we really want to have a 100% uh, success rate. So how can we do that? So people have tried different things. So one approach is to combine radial EBUS with navigation bronchoscopy. Uh, another uh, technique is to combine cone beam CT with navigation, and I believe that there's a presentation on that tonight on this. Uh, there are different navigation systems. Most people here are, are familiar with the SuperD uh, system, but there's also the Viren system and Ar Archimedes. Uh, and then we're also hearing now about robotic bronchoscopy, which my uh, partner, Dr. Maharjan, was going to be talking about today. And, and there's the Monarch or Oris system and the Iron or Intuitive uh, systems, which are starting to be tested uh, in, in some centers now. Now, looking at that radial EBUS, this was a, a randomized trial, uh, and the authors here looked at radial EBUS with navigation bronchoscopy, radial EBUS alone and, and navigation alone, and they found they got their best uh, responses or their best successes when they combined radial EBUS with uh, navigation. This is the Monarch platform that you see over here, and you'll see the, the joystick over here. And it's basically like a, a Game Boy controller. Um, and so a very different uh, uh, technique. And uh, over here, you can see my uh, partner, Dr. Maharjan, over here uh, using this in some trials. And so he was involved in initial uh, cadaver studies where they created uh, tumor uh, nodules uh, and then navigated into these nodules to uh, see how successful they were. And they were able to get a diagnostic yield of 97% using this uh, system at least in a, in a cadaver setting. So now it's going into clinical trials, and, and so our hospital was involved uh, in, in a multi-center trial that's being done in this, with using this technique. And so we recently performed 11 cases with this over the last six weeks. Initially, the procedures were performed in the operating room, and once we are uh, comfortable with the technique, then moved down to the bronchoscopy suite. Uh, we had on-site cytology, and these were all performed under general anesthesia. And the nodules ranged in size from 10 to 30 millimeters in the cases that were done uh, at our site. Uh, excuse me. And uh, here you can see on the video, uh, uh, using fluoroscopy, uh, they've already navigated down to the lesion. Uh, and now it's going to put in the radial EBUS probe just to show uh, that he's actually in the lesion. And uh, that you'll see the radial image coming in, and you'll see the tumor over there. And then if you look at the second video, this is at the subsegmental level. Uh, so you're going down much further than you can with a standard bronchoscope. Uh, and uh, you can see things that you could never see with a normal bronchoscope. Uh, and there you see the tumor and the probe right in there. So um, uh, showing how you can biopsy these things. Now, the second thing is it's not, you don't want to just get into the lesion. Uh, you have to think about the probe placement in relation to the tumor as well. And we know for the percutaneous uh, data, that you have to be centered within the lesion. You can't be on the edge of the lesion. You can't be on top of the lesion. You have to be centered in a, in a particular orientation uh, that's dependent on the probe that you're using. And, and so we'll have to be able to confirm that. So despite these limitations, there are some places that have been using this uh, technique clinically. This is one of the first groups. Uh, they're from Japan. And they did a uh, ablate and resect. So they ablated the lesions in uh, patients they were going to operate on and then studied them. They had 10 patients, uh, and they used three uh, different probe sizes ranging from 5 to 10 millimeters. The second two probes were water-cooled probes. Uh, and you can see here the pictures of the three probes that they used. And, and what they found was with the bigger probes and the water-cooled probes, they had bigger, bigger ablation. So they, they showed some, uh, uh, some efficacy there. And uh, the procedures were all safe without any complications. 
They then reported on two patients, uh, and they had no recurrence at four and three, point, uh, three and a half years after. So one patient then did have a recurrence and was treated with repeat ablation. Then they reported on 20 patients where they followed these patients for a while, uh, and the 20 patients had a total of 28 RF treatments. Local control was um, 82%, uh, percent, and five-year overall survival was 61%, percent, which is actually very reasonable for a very high-risk group treated uh, this way. This is another group from China, uh, who I believe have done more cases now, but they reported their initial three cases with navigation and ablation, and, and they had one patient who progressed. They had no complications in this uh, series. And this is a picture from their paper, and you can see here the pre-op picture, the intra-op, 72 hours, you can see some kind of haziness from the tumor destruction. At one month, you see some cavitation, and at three months, you see the lesion slightly smaller, but then at six months, the lesion has gotten bigger again. It's also hot in PET scan, and so they retreated that one patient. I got these slides from uh, Calvin Ng, and uh, he performed the first endobronchial microwave ablation in, in Asia in March of this year, and I think he's now on about eight to 10 cases. I'm not sure the exact numbers. He shared these uh, with me, uh, uh, and these are numbers that have been done throughout uh, the world using the imprint system, which is the, uh, uh, I think it's the, it's the Medtronic system. Uh, and you see a few cases in the United States, uh, in London, uh, and then uh, uh, also Calvin's uh, group in Hong Kong. And this is one of his cases. You can see here uh, the pre-ablation and then the image at one month using this uh, system. So I'll, I'll conclude by saying, that I think thermal ablation is still a, a, a real therapy. And per, uh, the results with percutaneous ablation, I believe are, for small tumors are as good as SBRT. Uh, and I think that the, this is coming. And I think as surgeons, we need to kind of embrace these technologies and figure out how to include this in our practices. Uh, the ablation technologies are evolving and also the approaches uh, to getting there are also uh, uh, evolving as well. And whether robotic uh, ablation is going to, um, bronchoscopy is going to become the standard, I don't know. I'll stop there and we'll hold for questions and, and do have kind of a panel discussion at the end. Thank you.